now, as you can see, you know, the little Spotify icon, um, Apple podcast, whatever system you're using, this is a Barbie review. Originally, I just want everyone to know, originally, this was supposed to be Josh, Ricky, and myself, but some family things came up. Josh, unfortunately, decided to pick yet another fight. This time, he just said that Wrexham is actually not a legit soccer team, and some Ryan Reynolds fans beat him up. So once again, he's hospitalized. As Josh has indicated, this is all a false narrative. He just had some family stuff come up. But I'm sticking with my story. He said, welcome to Wrexham sucks. <laughs> so I have with me my co-host, my frequent companion. You got to get an upgrade soon, right? To like first class with all these frequent flyer miles going from Seattle to Chicago constantly. How are you doing, Justin? I am fantastic. How are you, Ken? I'm doing great. It's just another <laughs> wonderful day in Kendom. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thanks for having me again. I again, oh, another uh, big summer movie. So it's um, it's going to be a fun episode. I'm glad I'm back to review the pinkest movie of the year. Oh yeah, and the largest opening of the year, 155 US, 310 worldwide, something wild like that. Huge. It's insane. Did you think Barbie was going to be this big versus Oppenheimer? I had it on my secret list of like, eh, it's going to do 50 or 60 million. And it's going to kind of exist. Uh, Oppenheimer, I figured would just be another Christopher Nolan movie where it makes 40 to 50, kind of chugs around for a few weeks. And you look at the box office and it's like, oh, he made 400 million again. Wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Both of these movies just out of nowhere. It's insanity, but it's great for movie theaters right now, which is oh, a plus. Fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I saw Oppenheimer yesterday. 12 o'clock showing on a Sunday, packed. I saw Barbie today. On a, I'm like, I never see movies on a Monday. And I was pleasantly surprised. It was a daytime showing, like 40 people maybe. An entire row, an entire, must be two or three families worth of children. Uh, I'm like, oh, wow. All in pink, <laughs> properly spaced out with a parental figure to you know, keep them in control. <laughs> Well, it's the same with me because my local theater, I'm usually I'm the only one there with the exception of maybe one or two, but the theater was packed and the same thing. It's just flooded with pink shirts, uh, pink hair, just everything. The energy from the crowd is, it was, it added to that experience. I thought it was super cool. Yeah. My wife, um, she works for a, a primarily female marketing company here in town and they're all, they all went this uh, afternoon to go see it. Uh, and then they took their spouses, the children with them. They all dressed up. One of the guys dressed like Malibu Ken. <laughs> I got to see a photo <laughs> of that. Um, the others were dressed like with all Barbie gear, fake big wigs and stuff like that. It, it, uh, it, it's interesting because in this year of of brand movies we've had uh tetris air jordan flaming hot cheetos one i want to say there's one more i can't think of it blackberry yeah the, the blackberry movie i mean if mm -hmm. you want to say transformers is brand i mean it is but it's not it, that's been around for a little while yeah but rb to, to to think it'd be so gangbusters of 155 million in the U u.s and canada alone especially with a cultural zeitgeist that like I remember in the mid 2000s, they're basically declaring Barbie dead. You know, like, oh, it's, I mean, it still was the number one brand, but it's lost, it lost, was it, to, I think they're the ghouls. Then they had those other ones with the big heads. I forget what their name is. Um, but there was a bunch of basically competitors that were more, um, not sterilized, uh, generalized or gender wise or, more targeted towards a certain group yeah, or whatever. Yeah. They were, they, they, they had a demographic pivot stylized. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, so, you know, th they were going away from the humanoid kind of look to like different and, and especially they were also going kind of counterculture a little bit with the whole, like really leaning into the darker colors, brighter colors. Maybe they're, you know, maybe they're tattoo teens kind of thing. <laughs> and I didn't realize that Barbie still just, they tapped a vein that just, work for them yeah and it's it's interesting to me especially as we see theaters i mean everybody from uh boys girls to whatever it may be everybody was getting in on this and you know barbie came out in like i think it was 1959 
And, you know, they've had their sense of controversy with their dolls. They've had a sense of just kind of weird dolls that have come out since then. You're looking at like a decades of just marketing of this movie of generation after generation. And in whether your view of Barbie is a negative one or a positive one, this is probably the longest marketing campaign for a live action movie that should have happened years ago. Oh, you, um, think? you would think with the popularity of it. But now it's all that built up to this. So to me, I'm surprised, but not surprised of the success of the weekend. I am surprised of the audience engagement. And this, what I love about it is it's not because of the theater staff trying to uh, market this movie or gain that experience. With all the trailers and the marketing that I've seen, I wouldn't have expected an audience reaction like this, which is energizing to me. I I was shocked because like the whole like, barbenheimer or whatever kind of like weekend thing i mean you know that seemed that that seemed kind of organic because i mean Mm -hmm. you have like a warner brothers movie and a paramount movie they're obviously not really going to team up against team up you had some like rumor was that um christopher nolan was a little irked because it's like don't they know that late summer is my time to release movies (laughs) even though he's only released like three of his seven movies in the late summer i mean obviously if you're going to go off of first weekend Barbie took Christopher Nolan out back and beat him with a sh- with a roller skate. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you can't. I mean, uh, you can't. I mean, anybody would be happy with seventy seven million US one sixty worldwide. I mean, you know, oh yeah, the Flash would have liked that. <laughs> <laughs> the Flash would have taken any donation with, wherever it could. Yeah, but you look at the also the the rating. Because obviously a PG-13 movie is going to do a lot better than a rated R uh, Christopher Nolan movie. I mean, you have, especially with the the marketing, and I'm sure we'll talk about it in a, in a little bit, of it targeting. The marketing goes towards, to me, I got the kids vibe, the family vibe to an extent. So obviously they're going to have more ticket sales with the family element than you will Oppenheimer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So before we get too deep in this, we do have a promo. Uh, Josh's friends over at the Cult Worthy just want to give them a little plug because I thought this was going to be a cult film and it is not. It is a zeitgeist moment. (laughs) (laughs) But we'll be right back after this quick promo break. The Cult Worthy Podcast. Join me, Antonio Palacios, each week as I guide you through a never-ending sea of obscure cinema and cult-worthy gems that deserve a rediscovery. Find me on all listening platforms and at thecultworthy.com. The Cult Worthy Podcast. Join us. And we're back. So, yeah, let's t- t- touch a brief moment on the marketing of this film. So, my in- I primarily am the one posting on Twitter or X, as it may now be called as of this morning. Good God. About, I was not amused necessarily by the release of Ken's song because it made him seem like a loser. Uh, spoiler alert, he is. <laughs> <laughs> but the, w- the way I interpreted the marketing was... So, so we talked about it like a week or so ago. You and I were kind of talking to each other about A24 films. And mm. A24 with like The Witch and It Comes at Night and some of the horror films, they kind of do a little bit of a bait and switch of like, especially It Comes at Night. You think this is like a slasher flick, something's haunting in the woods. I'm going to spoil a seven-year-old movie, but it's actually a disease. And <laughs> very prescient because in 2017, I was like, really? And then 2020 happened. I'm like, no, I'm completely on board with that family. Kill everybody who comes near you. Don't trust anybody, <laughs> anybody in the house. I don't care who they are. I don't care how many tests they take. They need to die. <laughs> yeah. Stay away. <laughs> my house is my castle. <laughs> but this one, I was like, okay. I, I was trying to f- figure out what, what they were trying to hit with it. And yeah, they were kind of aiming towards kids. They were also kind of girl power kind of thing of like, you know, oh, it's another Ken. Because they even in the movie itself i mean it literally is it's president barrio weird barbie stereotypical barbie um pilot barbie astronaut barbie the kens are all just called kent midge (laughs) (laughs) you know so it's kind of like a little bit of a slight girl empowerment kind of rah-rah thing embrace your embrace it and i was getting a lot of um spice girls kind of like feel for it like the spice girls really hit at the top of their game they released spice world which i think is a severely underrated movie definitely is a cult movie by now i loved that movie so much of course i was also the right demographic because of like a 13 year old boy but (laughs) (laughs) 
I, I, I thought Posh was cute. And I was in love with Baby for a little while. And then it was. Funny. Everybody was. <laughs> Everybody was. <laughs> so we're going to go full spoilers in a little bit. But the marketing of the movie is not what we got. <laughs> no, not at all. So, and I, here's, and it's funny you brought up uh, Spice World, director like Tim Hill. I was getting total vibes of Spice World. Um, I was reminded of a little bit, and it's not so much the toy aspect, it's the branding of it. And watching the trailers, I was almost having PTSD from the old 2000 Rocky and Bullwinkle uh, movie, the live action that was a complete disaster and dumpster fire that I never oh. want to revisit. Oh, yeah. But, you have that trailer that almost has that feel, that silliness, the all-star cast, that the colors, the 50, 60 humor that just seems like a dad joke. All that marketing on the trailer, I think I was one of those rare ones that I was not looking forward to just because of the history of these branding and silly movies that become live action. I mean, how many live action toys or based on cartoons have been a success that just really cater to that younger audience and the marketing. That's what they went after. And again, it's like our discussion on a 24. It was almost like a bait and switch, but to me, and we'll get into that probably in a little bit is more of something I wasn't expecting. And it, it wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but it definitely my take going into it was probably a little bit opposite to what a lot of people were feeling when watching the trailer. Yeah. I, I was just more like, okay, it's going to be a bunch of jokes. She's going to discover the real world. It's going to be kind of maybe like a mannequin situation. While I am dating myself, I am not in my 60s. I'm a 30 something year old man. <laughs> I just, my mom had me very young. I saw a lot of 80s movies growing up. <laughs> but, you know, the kind of like the whole discovering the world kind of thing to spoil the Lego movie that is probably seven or eight years old at this point, too. Like, Will Ferrell seemed like on on the nose casting especially in the trailers of the whole like oh barbie's gonna discover there's a real world out there the legos discovered this kind of a real world out there um and i wasn't jazzed to see it but i was a little intrigued especially when you have a name like noah Baumbach as mm -hmm. yeah. a co-writer and greta gerwig i i was a little afraid because i i followed i mean i'm not an intense a tense follower of her but I'm aware of what she's, you know, what she's done as an actress. I think she's very good in some of her movies. And I was a little afraid that with a $150 million Mattel paid for movie that we were going to get something a little, like a few little jokes here and there, maybe a little Deadpool like little pokes. I mean, okay. Okay. Deadpool does some really hard jokes, but <laughs> a few little things like this and kind of like a sugary message. Mm-hmm. Hell no, they went all in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which I will say that having two movies, brand, big brand movies, oh, Dungeons & Dragons, there's another one, big brand mm -hmm. movies, high budget. The Dungeons & Dragons movie was paid for by Hasbro. E1 is, they bought that company a few years ago basically to make this movie and lost their shirt over it so much so that yeah. they're selling the company. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have Mattel who paid for this movie. I'm actually really sad we didn't, we didn't get the Barbie treatment for Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved a bait and switch. Like, I mean, the movie was not to revisit Dungeons and Dragons, but it wasn't everything it should have been. It, yeah. Especially, I mean, it is very much, much more, a more niche film. It was a, I think it was a $150 million movie. This one was uh, Barbie's $150 million. Dungeons and Dragons is still not totally mainstream. Not every boy or girl grows up with a and d book in their household most households grew up with a Barbie. If you have sisters, you have a Barbie. And if you're like me and have sisters, you get bought a Ken to play with them. And I had Ken. I had pilot Ken. I had pilot Ken. He had like two or three different outfits. Um, I would play with my sisters all the time. My sisters, of course, had 10,000 Barbies and the car and the house and blah, 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 blah. I had Ken with like three outfits. <laughs> so before we go into spoilers, I will tell you one of my favorite things from childhood involving Barbie. I was playing with my sisters once, and we were playing Barbies. I'm a, I'm uh, older than my sisters by about eight to nine years. Uh, my sisters were born very close to each other, so like eight and nine years older than them. And we were playing Barbies together, and my sister, uh, who is getting married this year, and if I get a chance to talk, I'm going to mention this. 
I was annoying them like hell because I was having fun and like I was making the car drive around like the drive around and like do backflips and stuff and the Barbies were falling out. I'm like, oh no, and getting them back in and stuff, et cetera. She picks up the Barbie off the floor, rears her arm back, smashes me in the face with it the barbie full on and says you're not playing barbie right <laughs> i just kind of was like stunned looking at her i didn't do anything because i was like okay <laughs> and then we went back to playing barbies right <laughs> that's what happened to that barbie in the movie got it <laughs> you're your weird sister's fault and, exactly you're playing too hard <laughs> So before we dive into spoilers so that people can tune out, uh, you know, cut us short if they need to be, uh, here on Talking Smack, we only have, uh, we have a very simple rating system. Must see or pass because it's garbage and should be set on fire. What is your opinion on this? Hand down. And I was hinting to get your reaction before I gave mine um, in the messages <laughs> before. So, but honestly, we're going to get into it. And if I have to defend this movie to my death, I will, <laughs> but this one will be a must see for me. All right, Justin, despite everything I'm about to say, once we hit spoilers, it's a must see. Whoa. Okay. wasn't expecting that one. So uh, we're going to go into spoilers and I will let you know why I said in about four seconds, despite everything I'm about to say. So, do, 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 do. Oh, I really need to, I need to, like, load in, like, a spoiler or something. Anyway, so, <laughs> this movie, I think the reason why I don't embrace it and love it dearly, but I enjoyed it, is because I feel that there was executive notes that basically said, please make this somewhat empowering. <laughs> 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 and so the mixed messages we get because like uh, the mixed there, there's several scenes of like positive messages and resolutions that they then kind of like take back almost immediately and that's the part where i got really confused about some stuff towards the end the kens have staged a revolution <laughs> 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 which okay first okay wait before we get to that Will Ferrell's part should have just been completely cut out, cut out of this movie. The, 100%. The, 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 they could have cut it off at them chasing her out of the Mattel offices and never referenced them again, and there would have been no impact whatsoever in this movie. In fact, I don't even know what they, where they ended up at the end of the movie, other than they were briefly there when the resolution happened, and, and I'm assuming they go back. Well, they show that scene where they're, I thought, or if I'm completely off, where they're bicycling back or whatever it may be. Oh, was that... Them, yeah, they may have been them. Yeah, but yeah, I agree. It, it, it seemed like a part just to give Will, Will Ferrell for the credit. Um, yeah. I think it was drawn out. It made no sense. Like the meeting, totally, I get that. But oh, you're right. It should have been box. cut. Yeah. yeah. It's like it, they had no relevance other than stating what other characters are already saying. It's like almost just repetitive. Yeah, like the whole like get back in the box scene, I thought was like very fascinating. It had mm -hmm. a lot of um, symbolism in there, especially with the whole like doing the giant twist ties kind of thing. And yep. you know, it was, it was, I'm not sure I perhaps enjoyed the resolution for Ken because it seemed to be like, hey, listen, you need to be your own person in Barbie Land, which is like, okay, cool, that makes sense, and that is what he should be doing. But at the same time. Everybody kind of um, – the real world got what they wanted, which is no one gives a crap about Ken, so who cares? So Barbie Land's back in place, so who gives a shit about Ken? And then the kind of like the then takeaway joke of like, okay, so can we have a little bit of power and do some stuff? No. Maybe on the screen. <laughs> maybe on like a lower level circuit court. Yeah. Like, so some of that mixed messaging. And, and the other reason why I didn't particularly like love this movie is there's absolutely no resolution or there's no – discussion about why america ferrera of why she was unhappy and then why the daughter sasha is a dick <laughs> <laughs> just all of a sudden out of nowhere the daughter's like i like you again and i'm like but why were you such a dick you're such a dick that people at the school literally stop <laughs> anyone from talking to you because you're going to destroy their souls. 
<laughs> and you keep doing that scene to scene to scene, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, I guess we can be nice. I, I didn't understand that. That's the part maybe maybe I missed something, but like I never understood why the mom was re- relatively upset, and then why the daughter did a pivot. Yeah, well, the first two pieces, so the Will Ferrell and the Ken thing, I'm glad you brought up because those are my main problems with the movie. Those are a couple things I had issues with, especially when we go through the Ken piece of it. And he's in the real world. He's discovering his masculinity or how he should be in the real world, that stereotypical male. For a big half, for a big second half of the movie plot driver, I thought that piece was a little rushed and it almost was like situational comedy. And I thought that's where they were going to go with it. Yeah. But then it ended up being a big plot point and they should have spent a lot more time um, driving that and giving more intent, but going into the characters. And this is what I found very interesting. And this is where the symbolic piece was. And from Greta uh, Gerwig with her style, she's still a fairly new director when it comes to, what she's done. Lady Bird was fantastic, but a lot of some details, her messaging might not be clear, but this is what I loved about it. The messaging is up to interpretation. When you play with toys, you take these symbolic toys. The toys are going to act the way we interpret our actions, the way we interpret the world, the way we interpret our imaginations of how we should be. When you take a male, female figure, they're going to output exactly how they feel. These human characters are, and this, I believe, is intentional by Gerwig, is that she is trying to output the example of human characters. We won't communicate without the toys. We have that imagination of trying to make a point or live our lives through these plastic dolls. And then we have Barbie and Ken that are trying to do the same with the real world. It's a really deep thematic piece of it that I don't think was really nailed on the messaging, and some might be a little off on where the interpretation is going to fall. So it's, you're right to an extent that it's going to be a little confusing. It's like two, it's going to take two rewatches to kind of fully grasp everything. Yeah, no, I, yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, There's so much that is being said, like those are my quibbles, basically. The rest of the movie is just, I thought was just gorgeous to look at the way they did Barbie land with like, actual structures for the barbie houses and everything but then if you go to the beach there's actually no sand it's just kind of textured yeah the waves are actually just like plastic molds when they're traveling like between the realms kind of thing it's just the old stage kind of cardboard cutouts of things moving so i am somewhat famously not a fan of the lego movie because the decision to film it in crystal clear cgi mm. With then the stop motion, slightly slow frame rate just gives me a headache really, mm-hmm. really badly. Um, I can't, I can't, I can't, I've watched them all, had a headache each time, doesn't make it get better. <laughs> but I was looking at this going like, this is what they should have done with the Lego movie. They actually should have had like real physical sets with, I don't know, maybe Lego people, but right. then the CGI people moving through and something. Because I was just so obsessed with how beautiful it looked and i love the decisions that she had the actors going through like they go through the slot when they like go down a slide they kind of get the stiff arm and leg kind of thing of everything kind of straight and the oh like barbies don't ever go downstairs they're because kind of, the child lifts them and moves them down I'm like yeah that's actually yeah. true and kind of just kind of lift them and kind of float them down the stairs and i loved just how beautiful that was and i Basically, Barbie is going through an existential crisis, which I I laughed my ass off when that happened. <laughs> they're they're just living through Barbie world, and all of a sudden they're at a dance, and they're like, "How do you feel today?" And she's like, "Great." Does anyone ever think about death and everything stops, <laughs> and how like things are happening to her? And I think that the speech that um, uh, America gives about what it is like to be a woman, while it wasn't lost on me, <laughs> being uh, I. I'm a, I'm a male. I feel like that is so beautifully said and done that I really wish they would not have cut to reaction shots from the other Barbies, but just stuck on her because I didn't need to see Margot Robbie just kind of staring wide eyed and uh, at her. I would have mm-hmm. just loved for them to just linger on on the glory. Uh, her name is Gloria in the movie. 
because that speech felt honest. It felt like, especially knowing that it was written, um, it is written by Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach. But I, mm-hmm. but her, her coming through as an actress and then a lot of writing credits before being able to do low budget movies and then this big opportunity. I feel like she was pouring her heart and soul into what it is to be a woman who is in a male dominated industry that still overwhelmingly believes that when a woman hits the age of 40, they're either a mother or a grandmother and they should not be in roles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, especially we have, we have Napoleon come out later this year where Joaquin Phoenix, I think is almost 50 playing his, the, his wife is, I forget the actress's name, but she's about 35. And in real life, his wife was 10 years older than him. Yeah. So yeah. Hollywood still casts of you got to have a young, attractive woman, even if she's much older than him in real life and you're doing historical drama. The I will say the only time that I was slightly agitated about that speech is when they went back to it like three or four more times, add stuff to it as they deprogram as the Barbie. I was like, mm. I, 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 I get it. <laughs> <laughs> So what Bombach and Gerwig do here, it's these two have that chemistry, that writing chemistry that almost balance each other out. Um, I I mean, with a lot of Bombach's uh, Wes Anderson work, um, you have a lot of that uh, dryness, that symbolicness, but then you add Gerwig's uh, feminism uh, into that and to actually combine the two, you're going to get a well-written speech, but when you have it repeated over and over again, that's where you're absolutely right. We heard the the speech, but the reaction's going to be equally important. But here's what I loved about the overall message to it, and I think what was really well done, um, other than the the biggest speaking point was the female uh, piece of it being not fair or it, inequ- I can't talk right now. <laughs> the inequality. Thank you. Being cast above the messaging is we still get that today. We've had that from the 50s, 60s, and whatever decade it is, it's still there. And I think it is the right time, the right place, especially with a symbol to children that has been part of that controversy to say the right things. Barbie is not shined away from controversy. It, The way women look or how they should look has been a staple of Mattel with this toy. And the movie doesn't shy away from that. And I I want to applaud them, but at the same time, I don't. But they address that. They they poke fun at themselves. They It's almost like an apology to the public for their past wrongdoings of how we view women. To an extent, it's almost brilliant where they're reaching into the audience and just being upfront and honest, saying, our bad guys, this is how we thought of women. We had a male-dominant workforce. But this is our apology. This is our apology movie to you to make up for that. And does it make it right? Absolutely not. But the acknowledgement is the first piece of it. And that's what I do applaud this movie to do, along with Gerwig and Baumbach's uh, pen screenplay. I think it's very well done. Oh, I think it was well. The more I'm, this movie settling in, in with me, the more it actually reminds me of Tropic Thunder. That's a mm. big, huge, $100, $150 million satire movie about the about hollywood about executives about the entire process and and actors in general and there is sometimes i watch that movie and i'm like how the hell did this get made because it seriously is a massive middle finger to hollywood yeah about actors being overly pretentious uh and and so many of the themes that they said in that movie like you know especially about like you know of course, if you're going to have like a strong black lead role, it's going to be like a white guy who takes it. We saw um, some of our actors these days keep taking roles that are meant for minorities and just saying, yep. oh, well. And so looking at this the way to Mattel, the thing I found funniest about that about that messaging is that, yeah, um, did you ever watch um, the Toys That Made Us Barbie episode? Yes. 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 And they interviewed the female CEO from the 90s who oversaw some of the controversies like the math is hard Barbie. And Mm -hmm. I love what she had said about like, yes, no matter how many positive steps we carry forward for women with representation of what our Barbies do and what our Barbies are, that they are Barbies are astronauts, our Barbies are engineers, our Barbies are are hard workers, presidents and all this stuff. You make one mistake and immediately they turn on you. 
and this movie said that beautifully and i love i did i wish the will ferrell character would have been a more dramatic actor or the takes more dramatic because will ferrell can do drama yeah. very well such as um remember season uh he figures out stranger than fiction love, he's so good in that mm-hmm. yeah but the whole like it was almost too cartoonish of like we've had two women ceos the one in the 90s and the one other one we are all men we are men who love women who were birthed by women we are sons of mothers mothers of sons <laughs> <You know? laughs> i mean yeah there's there's that stuff like that is really how i feel like tropic thunder was of like the whole like yeah we're, we're giving an nephew to the people who are funding us right now and i loved it and i did love how we how ken is just so confused about wait a second the world is like is run by men that's what i've been looking for like my entire life but yeah. it's not it's not what he's looking for his entire life what he was looking for is just to be acknowledged mm-hmm yeah, and I actually did like that at the end with the resolution of the whole patriarchy thing. That it was just Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling together sitting on the bed talking, and she just acknowledges that, like, yeah, not every night needed to be girls' night. I could have spent some time with you. Yeah, I thought that was a really beautiful moment. Completely, and I think they that was the perfect bow on the messaging where. We have this really well-told story of themes and messaging of women empowerment, and I love the fact that they make it for everybody. It's a, it, There's a strong message, but it's equalized throughout a relationship even to that yeah. point between Barbie and Ken. And the movie starts us off with knowing exactly where it's going to go with the baby dolls, what we expect women to do is to give birth, be moms. And then uh, Ruth Handler came out with the first Barbie. And this is, no, no, no. You're not supposed to give birth. This is what you're supposed to look like. And it adds to that expect that social expectation. And uh, then the movie takes us through those stages of womanhood or social anxieties or social expectations. And then you have, like you said, that beautiful scene of how a relationship should be between two partners or two people or two individuals. And it is an absolutely beautiful scene. I I loved it. Honestly, I don't, I mean, you said it just so well. I actually don't have a whole lot else to say about the movie because the plot is fairly straightforward. There's a lot of great little uh, digs here and there. Um, I did want to ask you though, like, did the Ruth Handler stuff work for you? I mean, we had Rio Perlman playing Ruth Handler. As soon as she was on screen, I realized I was like, I know who this is. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, and then she, um, there, she has an early scene where she doesn't really reveal who she is, but then there's a scene at the end where she does, and a weird existential scene. That scene becomes weirdly existential and bizarre. I'm not sure I understood all of it, but did any of that work for you? It did. With Perlman, I think, one, she was a perfect choice for that. Um, She's always lovable on screen, no matter what she does. But here's where it goes into that point of being the upfront and honest, because it recognizes, kind of, it sums it up of, we all have faults. Ruth even brings up the tax evasion of (laughs) things that she's done wrong. And she wasn't a perfect human being. None of us are. And that was a piece, just a piece of the pie of the messaging is, we have these certain expectations, even though I don't think uh, her example of breaking the law should be a very good tie-in. But <laughs> you know, but but we have these social expectations of each individual, and the only ones that can decide how we live our life is us. We don't have to have a Ken. We don't have to have a Barbie. Whatever it may be, telling us how to live our lives. It's one of those we have to define our reality. We have to define um, who we are and how we grow. By having mm-hmm. outsiders uh, bring us down like the CEOs of companies telling us you're not good enough, whether you're male or female, I think Perlman did a fantastic job as Ruth kind of summing that up to say, just in case you did not understand, this is something for everybody to take away something from. It's not just for boys. It's just not for girls. It's for humans to really relate to. So to me, it worked to an extent that it put a nice little tight bow on the messaging. Thank you. That actually, she was well put and actually makes me appreciate that scene a little bit more. 
I was just like at that point I was like this is like the fourth or fifth ending we've had where it could have just <laughs> and then I was like this is I don't know what's going on here I'm not sure I quite understand it but I be- believe the mannequin is going to come to life <laughs> and we're going to have I... like a Tron like a Tron legacy moment here where the digital creation is actually in the real world and now I have further questions of what does that actually mean how did Cora get into the real world and how is she alive I need to explore this. <laughs> I didn't know how this movie was going to end or where it was going to go. The yeah. only thing I knew was it was going so well, even though there were some clunky parts here that I wasn't a huge fan of, but yeah. I, you know, I would have been pissed if they would have just stopped the movie and went into like a musical number or just went into like a dance off or whatever it may be. I was kind of getting that vibe that it was going to end the movie that way without an emotional element. So I'm glad they kind of went in the direction that they did. Yeah, it's good. Honestly, Justin, that's really all I have because like it, it was unexpected. It was fun. It was I? I mean, if we were not using the you know the talking smack kind of like, let's just say there was a star system like between like one to four stars, I would probably lean towards maybe like a two point five for me. But we don't have that on that. That's that's maybe someone else's show. Someone else's show. Yeah, I mean, I heard his show's pretty good. I don't know. We'll have to wait till his review comes out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Listen to Justin from the Movie Wire. <laughs> I do want to see it another time before I give official. I'm bouncing between one to two reviews. So I thought you were saying one to two stars. I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It, it it'll definitely it will definitely be high. I just don't know yet. I want to tighten up some things before I give it for sure, but. It's a definitely, for the talking smack rating, it's a for sure must-see. But I would mm-hmm. see it before. I wouldn't expect it to be 100% for every child that walks into the theater. Like, the previews make it look. Mm-hmm. So that's the only thing I would be cautious of. Uh, definitely. All right. So f- you can follow Josh at Twitter or X at Josh underscore Scar. That's S-K-A-A-R. You can follow us at Talking Smack Pod. You can join our Discord at TSmackPadGee tsmackpod at gmail.com you can thank Leo Allen for all our musical themes you can thank Beppo and Richard Lowe Studio for our avatars you can thank Justin from the Movie Wire podcast Justin where can they find you you can check me out on X or Twitter at Movie Wire Show and you can listen to me wherever you listen to podcasts yes and just so you know that the music you're hearing in the news right now that is by Aqua having finally settled their grief with the tell he's sweeping for like five or six years straight with Julie in multiple courts in multiple countries because of the Barbie Girl song that they then play in the movie. (laughs) I'm not at all bitter about that. (laughs) (laughs) I am a little bitter that this is a remix version of the infection not the actual (laughs) song. Come on, Alex. Let's go party. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was so disappointed that when I when I heard it, and I was like, oh, did they finally settle? Like, did everything get settled? And like, you know, maybe they threw them some money since they drugged them through courts for years over a parody song. And it was a remix. I was like, oh, well, I saw that in the soundtrack, like on I was like in the soundtrack. I'm like, they did not get it in. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> Um, I, I will say this though, that can fight. With me. The what? Oh, can yes. Fight. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> Just the horses alone. <laughs> like even when they didn't have the horses, they were getting up. Yeah, they were doing. The, oh my gosh! And then it then breaks into a full fifties musical where they become <laughs> friends during it. And I'm like. Oh. oh god i wish we would have talked about the choreography on that was actually pretty on point oh yeah the fight choreography is amazing with some of them like 
and I, okay, I have a question. Did you catch it as well that like so they're saying that like they they don't have guns or anything, so they really can't hurt each other. Yeah. But then one of the, the one of the executives gets shot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then later is in a sling, and I'm like, who shot you? <laughs> That, we'll see that in we'll see that in the cutscenes. It's Will Ferrell. He needed to have an extra like three seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, I, I enjoyed it. I, yeah, I'm just glad they didn't make it just a silly, silly, silly like made yeah. for toddlers. I I am just so relieved. So am I. Yeah. 